Hey family, thanks for joining us today. Um, we have a special guest, Neil Anderson, with us today. He's unpacking how to live with a biblical worldview. The woke movement is about as legitimate as their ability to spell awakened. I mean, I just... <clears throat> we're living in incredible times, aren't we? I mean, it's... Uh, if there's ever a time we need God's perspective, it's now. I mean, it's... Uh, and uh, I just uh, told the pastor, I said, I just finished, I hope, is my last book. <laughs> Come out sometime later this year, maybe. It's um, called Surviving End Times. And um, I don't know if these are the end times or not, but I tell you, if there was ever a time that you want to hang on to Jesus, it's right now. <laughs> you need that rock-solid foundation of truth, and because uh, you're going to be so easily swayed, or as we all are. And uh, it's just absolutely amazing. It's like we've lost our conscious mind. You know, we're calling right, wrong, and it's just all over the place. It's, and it's universal. I think what's so unusual about our time, I mean, this world, ever since the fall, has had uh, wars and rumors of wars, have had pestilences, but never global like this. Everything now is global. Your internet, the pandemic, everything. I mean, it's just, what happens here is somebody's looking at their smartphone in Australia and they're getting it, you know, the same time you're getting it. So it's really an unusual time to be alive. It's, um, uh, let me start with the first slide here. I said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You all know that. <laughs> but did you ever wonder why it said heavens? Why is that plural? We don't know much about that, to be honest with you. We know a lot about the earth and uh, a lot of things that we can see and read. And, and uh, I'm going to start there. I'm going to start with what we do know. I mean, what we can observe and what we have learned from history and get, to, get up to this point. But uh, I had the privilege back in the 60s, yes, I'm that old, uh, <laughs> of working on the Apollo space program <laughs> And we had the guidance system for the lunar lander. And it was at that time that, we, that I personally found Christ. But uh, it was also a time when they developed the Hubble telescope. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but January 25th last year, uh, the James Webb telescope came out. And that's many times more powerful than the Hubble was. And the point of it is, is that you can see into space, you know, in ways we never have been able to see before. And there are solar systems far bigger than ours, and they're countless. And stars far bigger than ours, and black holes, and novas, and supernovas. It's, it's just absolutely mind-boggling to me. The heavens and the earth are declaring forth and showing the glory of God. The expanse, the expanse, the work of his hand. You know, the writer of that never, all he saw was standing on this globe looking up and seeing our own galaxy. I wonder what he would write today. I mean, you can't say any more than that. But in all of that vastness that exists out there, all of that is devoid of life. And uh, it, it didn't originate from any pre-existing matter. There's only one creator. Our creator, however, is living. And he is the mind behind that universe. And on one dinky little planet, Earth, <laughs> he created Adam and breathed into him the breath of life. Now, prior to that, if you read your Bible in chronological order, uh, he created the birds of the sky, the beasts of the field, the fish of the sea. All of that organic life is subject to the law of sin and death. It will all eventually die. If it has not some means to propagate itself, it would go out of existence. Something totally unique was introduced into this universe that God shared his divine life with Adam, who was created in his image and his likeness. He was alive two ways, physically. His soul was in union with his body. If you die physically, what happens? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Life means to be in union with, death is separation. But he was also spiritually alive, his soul was in union with God. If he ate from the tree of life, he could have lived forever. But if he ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, on that day, he would surely die. He ate and he died. 
Not physically, he lived 930 years or something, but he died spiritually. He was separated from God, sin separated him from God. This is all stuff we know. And uh, from that time on, everybody who is born physically alive on planet Earth is born dead in their transgressions and sins, spiritually dead, separated from God. Now, enter the gospel. Three things had to happen <laughs> in order for God to restore a fallen humanity. Uh, you look at, at Scripture and, uh, and, and just read your Bible. You can't escape the fact that essentially it's all about spiritual warfare. It's a battle between good and evil, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God's beloved Son, the Christ and the Antichrist, the Father lies, the Spirit of truth, false prophets, true prophets. That's what happened in the, in the garden. And you read the book of Revelation, it's all back again into the Antichrist and spiritual warfare. You can't escape that fact. But uh, to have the whole gospel, I've had the privilege to travel around this world. Turn to Colossians chapter 2 for a moment. And let me just read something. It's uh, most of the church around the world is struggling along, believing a third of the gospel. And by that I mean uh, we presented Jesus as the Messiah who came to die for our sins, and if we put our trust in him when we die, we'll go to heaven. That may sound all right, but it would give you the impression that eternal life is something you get when you die. That is not true. <laughs> he who has the Son has the life. He who doesn't have the Son doesn't have the life. Thank God for Good Friday. Thank God that God died for my sins. But what the early church celebrated was the resurrection. He was the first fruit. What Jesus came to give us was life. What Adam and Eve lost was life. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. You will continue to live spiritually even if you die physically. So eternal life, if you're a true born-again believer, is what you possess right now. But he didn't come just to go to that cross or just to be resurrected. He came to undo the works of Satan. First yes. John 3 eight clearly states that. Now, people, that third of the gospel is what most of the world is waiting to hear. The most predominant religious orientation of this world is spiritism. Any missiologist will tell you that. All of Indonesia, Africa, Latin America uh, are steeped in spiritism. 85% of the Brazilian population are practicing spiritists. And they leave little baskets of fruit around to appease the deities or they contact their shamans or the quack doctors or the witch doctors or somebody that somehow trying to manipulate that spiritual world or ward off evil spirits or bring about healing or seek guidance. It's here too just a little more disguised. I remember when I used to travel a lot more than I do now, you know, I'd get home kind of late or watch TV on the road or something, and all these psychics would promise all kinds of things. Now the California psychics are on prime time, and for a dollar a minute, you'll get guidance, and they have testimonies that sound like you were in church. You know, changed my life, gave me direction, whatever, false guidance. And uh, so that third of the gospel seems to me almost totally missing in our culture because we are so wrapped up in our rational and naturalism. Colossians 2, 2 verse 13 says, When you were dead, spiritually, obviously, in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. Again, that life, alive, means your soul is in union with God. Most commonly presented in the epistles as being alive in Christ, in him or in the beloved. It means your soul is in union with God. That's what salvation is. And um, uh, having forgiven us of all our transgressions, having canceled off the certificate of debt, consistent of the decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. All three aspects of the gospel. Thank God for Friday, Good Friday. <laughs> Thank God I'm, my sins are forgiven. But I have life. 
I have life. I've come that you may have life and have it more abundant. That's not your physical life, people. That's your spiritual life. That's your soul right now in union with God. He's my father. I'm his child. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. The Holy Spirit is bearing witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. Now here's a fascinating thing. Of all the privilege, privilege that I've had to work with people all over the world who are struggling in their faith, unresolved issues in their life, all had one thing in common. None of them knew who they were in Christ. None of them. Still true to this day. Why is that? And uh, I got to admit, I struggled with that myself. When I left the pastor to teach a seminary, I went there searching for answers myself because I had people in my church who had problems I didn't have adequate answers for. And uh, that 10 years that I taught there was an incredible journey, and my eyes were opened up to who I was. And not only that, I started to realize the spiritual battle that's going on for the mind of our people. Uh, but all of that's new. I mean, that's, that's recorded in history. It's recorded in the Scripture. But when you start looking at the spiritual realm, I said, what we don't realize, before this planet Earth, God created his first family. It's called Elohim. The most common word for God in the Old Testament is Elohim. But that's not just God. Satan is an Elohim. The host of heaven is a Elohim. They're spirits, uh, often too referred to in scriptures as heavenly beings or spiritual beings or basically sons of God. Now, a third of those fell and became, you know, Satan became the, the god of this world, the ruler of this world, and, and all of his demons took a third of the Elohim with him. And, and that's oftentimes missing. Now, I understand something very carefully. There's only one Jehovah God. There's only one creator. Even though he is himself an Elohim, he's an Elohim because he's a spirit. He's a divine being. And all the others are created beings and obviously have a will because they chose. And, and the third of them chose to separate themselves from God. And, uh, and Satan became the ruler of this world. Now, that existed before this family of God did. <laughs> and uh, so when you entertain the, uh, uh, the concept of, of, of the spiritual realm that exists around us, uh, there's a spiritual world. There's also a natural world. And my next diagram up there. Um, look at the diagram for a second. This spiritual realm, scripturally called the heavenlies, is just an environmental thing around us, okay? Planet Earth we know. We know the natural things of this world. But in those two realms are two types of players, humanity and Elohim, humans and spirits. Uh, oh, I'm not pitting opposites against each other. Uh, what I want to do is lay out kind of a diagram to see where we are at in terms of putting our emphasis. If you're in that far left corner, that all that exists in your mind is a natural world in human beings, then you are naturalist or a rationalist. Now, naturalism means that everything that exists can be observed through my five senses. And uh, a rationalist is that, is that I can explain everything simply by human reason. Now, that's the way I was educated. <laughs> that is your presently educational system. It's been influenced quite a bit differently recently, but, but that's Western education, is a rational and a natural basis for that. And that's how I was raised. I was an aerospace engineer. I was so left-brained at one time, my head tilted on one side. I mean, <laughs> thinking there's a natural answer for everything, natural explanation. And uh, in fact, to be honest with you, that's almost by definition anymore. To get a research doctorate, you have to buy into that. And uh, if you don't buy into it, you're not going to get your doctorate. And uh, so that's where, for me, it was like, I was living in a one-story building, and, uh, but there was an attic there. And that's kind of how we perceive the spiritual realm. There's something in the attic. 
and, or in the closet or under my bed. <laughs> and I said, that's our Western world view. Truth of the matter is, there is no attic and there's no walls in the building. There is no barriers to the spiritual realm. And uh, I mean, it's very much like walking into a building and then getting in an elevator in the building and all of a sudden your phone rings. What? <laughs> Nothing attached to it. Don't you find that kind of intriguing? Can you imagine presenting to that to somebody in this country 50 years ago? They go, they go out of their mind. What's that ringing? <laughs> and I said, well, actually, that is a natural phenomenon. There are radio waves. They've been there all along. We just discovered them, you know, in the uh, human in the last 50, 60 years or so. But um, in the spiritual world, is like that as well. I said, you really can't see it. So we got to trust in God to give us the definition and the explanation of the world that we're living in. But you can see the effects of it everywhere. People paying attention to deceiving spirits and lies. You know, Paul's take on this is really intriguing. 1 Timothy 4.1, the Holy Spirit, listen, he doesn't use this language anywhere else. The Holy Spirit explicitly says in latter days people are going to fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceiving spirits and teachings of the demons. It's happening right now all over the world all over the world. And uh, somehow we have to come to terms with that. Now in the middle of this diagram is the God-man. One of the most important beliefs that you can possess is a true knowledge of God and a true knowledge of who you are as a child of God. But the truth about Jesus was, and what the whole ecumenical councils, I mean, labored over and struggled with back in the first millennium, was defining Christ as one person but two characters. Fully God, fully man. And so he's the perfect example in the middle of this. And he showed in your scriptures his superiority over the natural world as well as the spiritual world. Don't miss that point. And uh, being fully aware of both all the time, being omniscient, of course, uh, he could have an experience like this when he asked his apostles, who do people say that I am? Well, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Well, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. You know, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but your father who's in heaven. So I, that divine knowledge came to you. And then he says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, be crucified, dead, and buried. And Peter says, oh, no, don't do that. Save yourself. Get behind me, Satan. Where did that thought come from? It didn't come from God. And God and Christ pointed it out immediately. Would that be embarrassing or what? That wasn't the only time. Poor old Peter. I call him the one-legged apostle. He always had one foot in his mouth. And, um, <laughs> you know, there's a Mount of Transfiguration, and, and suddenly poo -poo, Moses and Elijah are there, and Peter blurts out, let's build three tabernacles. Three? Poof, poof, two of them are gone. This is my beloved son. Is that embarrassing or what? You know, <laughs> had to limp off the mountain. Anyway, it's uh, uh, the problem that we have here in the West, which you don't have in other parts of the world, is uh, just accepting the reality of that spiritual world. But Paul puts it very bluntly. He said, that what you see is temporal. That what you don't see is eternal. And uh, so the spiritual world is not only just as real, in one sense, it's eternal. More real, probably, in the real sense of the word. Well, look at uh, my diagram. Next, next one is, uh, what is heaven? You know, well, first of all, you know, historically through the church, they've looked at it three different ways. Heaven, first of all, is the abode of God, our Father who art in heaven, who exists in the spiritual realm. Okay, but they also talked about the stellar heavens. That's the heavens and the earth declare forth and show the glory of God, the stellar star, of course. In other words, the expanse of the, of the universe. But more specifically, they talk about the heavenlies. And what that is, is just the spiritual realm. It invades this room here right now. It's like, you know, somebody said, well, you mean there could be demons here? Well, frankly, according to Scripture, yes, there are. Let me tell you what else is here germs 
<laughs> How many have seen a germ? Hmm. But you believe there are, right? <laughs> yeah, I've seen a few Germans, but I've never seen a germ. And uh, now, frankly, because there are germs here, what should we do? Where are they? You start scratching and itching and whatever else. I said, you start looking for germs, you're going to be a hypochondriac. The only proper response to the fact that there are germs here is to live a balanced life. Get enough rest, exercise, and diet, and your immune system will take care of you. Well, there's demons here. So, live a righteous life. It's really as simple as that, to be honest with you. And uh, that's what God has called us to do, is to live a righteous life. Your immune system is Christ himself. You put it on the armor of God, you're putting it on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, um, now, uh, so this atmospheric, you know, heavens, this present reality around us today, uh, is mentioned five times in the book of Ephesians. You know, I kid a few of my fellow travelers, pastors, and that. I said, you could teach the whole book of Ephesians and never even focus on or bring out the reality of what he's saying in terms of that spiritual realm. I've done it, to be honest with you, in, in, in times past. But, uh, but first of all, where are you blessed? Just I've, I've printed these out on your outline. We just wanted you to see it. It says, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. So somebody who's really feeling blessed, what you really feel blessed in is the fact that you are alive in Christ and God has given you the peace of God that passes all understanding. And what would you exchange for that, by the way? A new house, a new car? In, uh, but to have that sense of God's presence in your life, just blessed with the presence of God who's going to meet all your needs, set you free, whatever. Uh, now, what Jesus came to do was to do, undo the works of Satan. When you look at spiritual warfare, authority is the issue. And authority is all about your position in Christ. It's, uh, authority is the right to rule. Power is the ability to rule. To set you up for this, when Jesus chose his disciples, uh, he first chose them. You just come and watch me and and then after a while, we'll do it together. And then there's going to be a time when you just go out and I'll kind of observe you. And uh, that whole process was just laid out for us in the Gospels. You get to Luke chapter 09, and they're in that third phase. He said, now you, I'm going to, you go out. What's the first thing he says to them? I've given you authority and power over demons. First thing he said to them. Next chapter, he sends 70 out, and they come back. First thing they said was, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. Now, they're fully aware of that, see, uh, and we're astonished by it, to be honest with you. And so they were aware of the spiritual realm because suddenly, all of a sudden, they realized, man, we got authority over this. The Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples. Oh, don't preach that verse without the previous one. All authority has been given to me in heaven and upon this earth. Go, therefore. You can't delegate responsibility without authority. So authority is the right to rule. Power is the ability to rule. Authority is because of your position in Christ, which we'll get to in a moment. Power is the ability to rule. As long as you are abiding in Christ, if you carry out, if you fill the Spirit, you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. Try standing in the flesh. You'll get thrashed. Um, so he's preparing the 12 just for this very, very purpose. First the 12, then 11, then Pentecost comes and God sends his Holy Spirit to all of his children, his believers. But more importantly, to accomplish this, Jesus had to set the stage first. So look at the next verse. The Heavenly Father raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places above all rule and authority and power and dominion, every name, not in this age, but in the ages to come. Includes your mother-in-law, even. Anyway, uh, next, next verse. Now, notice this. Because of his great mercy and love, our Heavenly Father made us alive and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. So here you are. You're a child of God, but you're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. That's not some far-off distant thing of Pluto and Mars. That's the spiritual realm that is around us. And the throne of God is the ultimate authority of the universe, and you're a joint heir with Jesus. 
Now, he's delegated that responsibility and given us the authority to carry on the work of, of Christ on earth. We are continuing God's work. But you, you've been given the authority and power to do that. It's not the authority to do your will, by the way. It's to do his will. And the power is really dependent upon your own personal walk with God. Okay? But you have potentially both. All of us do. Now, what's the eternal purpose of that? Look at the next verse. The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus. Imagine that. You know, I'm a believer in purpose. You know, you need to know why. If you don't know why, <laughs> you don't know why you're here. But um, if you know how, you'll always have a job, but you're always going to work for the one who knows why. And um, so here's the eternal purpose of God to make his wisdom known through the church, through you and I, to who? Spiritual forces. How are we doing? Since half the church didn't even believe they exist, or functionally don't anyhow. And so consequently, in summarizing this, he says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Think about that for a moment. That's the eternal purpose of God to make his wisdom known through us. So what is our struggle? <clears throat> it's, 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 it's spiritual warfare. And, and how does that manifest itself? Primarily a battle for the mind. Uh, primarily. Well, just defining a couple of things, look at the world from God's perspective. Satan is presently the ruler of this world. We know that we are of God and that the whole world, the whole world, I mean, if you believe of the Bible, take this literally. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. <clears throat> I'm a fan of Chrysostom. He was uh, truly one of the great church fathers who uh, really fought out and worked out through the Nicene Creed and all that type of thing. He's an amazing man. He says, uh, why does he call the devil the ruler of this world? Because virtually the whole of humanity surrendered to him. All are his voluntary and willing slaves. Few pay any heed to Christ who promises unnumbered blessings. Rather, they follow the devil who promises nothing but leads them all to hell. He rules in this age where he has more subjects than God, more who obey him rather than God. All but a few are in his grasp on account of their laxity. I think he's dead right. In fact, I'm sure he is. And, uh, and of course, it's a tragedy. I see, you know, evangelicalism, you know, over the years has really focused uh, an awful lot on, on the judicial aspects of God because of sin and that he died for our sins and we focus the cross and that's a great symbol of Christianity. I said, but you read some of the church fathers, all of that is what I said is true. But it's a little different thing to think of God as a heavenly father who sees the fall of humanity and wants to give them life. To do that, he went to the cross, but he wants to give us life. He came that we may have that life. Where's the life? Do people even know that? They, they don't people. It's just really, to me, tragic. And yet, to me, so clearly written in Scripture. So here the whole world lies in the power of the even. And according to Revelation, he deceives the whole world. That's why, if you want to know what God's take is right now on the world that we're living in, he's given it to you. In the high priestly prayer, uh, he's still on planet Earth. He's about to go to the Father and leave behind his eleven. I thought he chose 12. No, he's down to 11. Who was it that put in the heart of Judas to betray Christ? Satan did. So he said, I ask not that you should take them out of this world, but you keep them from the evil one. How? Sanctify them in thy word. Thy word is truth. Truth. You put on the armor of God, you gird your loins with 
truth. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. See, we're on a spiritual struggle. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. And you say, well, well, but how? Well, how many have experienced some form of temptation this last week? And the rest are liars. <laughs> how many experienced the last five minutes? You know, I mean, it was, it's, um, I mean, you know, and Scripture clearly presents that. He tempted Eve, he tempted Jesus, you know, so obviously that is the major struggle. We're fully aware of that, by the way. How many have struggled with the accuser, the voice of the accuser of the brethren? He accuses us day and night, Scripture says. You know, if I ask it that way, you say, oh, I don't know. I said, but if I ask the question this way, how many have struggled with thoughts? I'm stupid, I'm dumb, I'm ugly, God doesn't love me, this isn't going to work. I... You don't have to raise your hand, folks, every one of you have. But here's the struggle. If I tempt you, you know it. If I accuse you, you know it. But if I deceive you, you don't know it. There is the primary, primary battle. It is, people. Uh, that's why you can look at somebody, reason with somebody, and you get nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. And uh, now, <clears throat> this whole struggle, because Paul's passage that the latter generation, people are going to fall away from the taste, paying attention to deceiving spirits. Over all these years working with hurting humanity around the world, I found one thing in common of every defeated Christian. None of them knew who they were in Christ, nor understand what it meant to be a child of God. And every one of them is struggling in their mind. They have no mental peace. Some are hearing voices, condemning thoughts. Giving an illustration, one of our professor's wives at the seminary got pneumonia and uh, wasn't responding to treatment. They took a liter and a half of fluid out of her lungs, and uh, then they found the cancer. And uh, I went on my summer tour and came back, and he called me and said, my wife uh, wants to see you. And I said, sure, I'll come over. And um, so she wanted to see me by myself. She's kind of embarrassed. And... Uh, her husband, and uh, she said, Neil, I'm not sure I'm a Christian. Now, folks, this is about as lovely human being <laughs> as you could meet. And I said, Robin, if you're not a Christian, I'm in deep trouble. I said, why would you think that way? Oh, I go to church and have these blasphemous thoughts. I said, Robin, did you want to think that thought? Did you make a conscious choice to think that thought? No, then why do you think it's yours? Now, to be honest with you, she had never had anything like that explained to her before. With her maturity, frankly, the voices were gone and all that stuff afterwards. Um, but her, she went through treatment, died two years later. But all the testimonies about her life for the last two years, never questioned her salvation again, uh, she became known as the number one person to go to for prayer on campus. And um, it was really kind of remarkable in a way. But why was she fearful? Well, if those thoughts are hers, what would she conclude about herself? How could I have these thoughts and be a Christian? So she's doubting her salvation, and she's facing the prospect of death. That's why she's afraid. What do you think happened to her fear? It's gone. Fear of death is the biggest issue that people probably struggle with. And, and, um, but I'm not the only one who's experiencing, you know, people who are hearing voices. Every psychologist and psychiatrist in this country is. You know, so how would they explain that? Well, it's a chemical imbalance. Well, how could a chemical produce a personality and a thought? How can my neurotransmitters randomly create a thought that I'm opposed to thinking? And you have a natural explanation for that? I'm open. What is it? There isn't one. What you hear is I gave antipsychotic medications and the voices stopped. Well, sure, so did everything else. All you did was narcotize it. Take away the drugs, voice it back. You didn't solve anything. You just covered it up. That's what most of my medicine does, to be honest with you. You just deal with the symptoms. And... Uh, I said, uh, 
uh, if you don't know this, you should be aware of it. The primary reason people take drugs and drink is for that very reason. They have no mental peace. And so they drown it out for a little while, only to wake up the next morning a little worse off than they were the day before. And so, folks, this is just happening all over the world. I, I mean, it's, it, it's such an interesting thing to me because I'm a pastor teacher. I, I'm not a psychologist, uh, and yet I may be the only one who's written books on anger and anxiety disorders and depression and whatever else, all from a biblical worldview, uh, because we've got to get God back into this process. And, and uh, to my almost shock, you know, the American Association of Christian Counseling International Meeting every two years have invited me to come. I did a training video for them, and I've had their biggest workshops the last three times in a row. And, um, you know, I'm really crawling cross-current to what they're doing, you know, because their whole situation, I'll just sit down and talk to you as though somehow I'm the one who's going to fix you. I don't do that. I sit down with another person, and God is present. The only one who can fit you and set you free is God himself. It ain't me. And... Um, I'm just facilitate a process like Mary does there. It's, uh, and so that is the struggle. Now let me illustrate this in kind of, a, I think, a fascinating way. Uh, if you look at your outline there, there's a thing, mystery revealed. Here's the passage. We do not speak wisdom among those who are mature. We do speak, I'm sorry. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers, Archonides. Satan is called the ruler of this world, Archon. These are Archonites. They're demons of this age who are passing away. Now, you can read that in your English translation. It sounds like the Jewish leaders of the day are the ones who are going to physically die. That just simply is not true, folks. Uh, he isn't even talking about death there. I got something here I want to read. It, um, that word... Uh, passing away, it's also in 1 Corinthians later on, and this is what it said, the end comes when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. Abolished is the same way. So he's talking about not the Jewish leaders of the day, but the rulers of this world, which are demons. And uh, now here's the point. It's really fascinating, but we speak God's wisdom in the mystery. Mystery means something that hasn't previously been revealed. It's not mysterious. It's nobody's talking about. It was the hidden wisdom, which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So here comes Jesus and he's proclaiming the kingdom of God. Now, up to this time, there's only one kingdom. There's the kingdom of darkness. So Satan sees this coming. And what's he want to do? How can I stop the kingdom of God? Kill Jesus. And he played right into God's hand. He didn't know there would be a resurrection. His disciples didn't know that. Nobody knew that. I don't even think the angels did. I think only the Godhead did. And, uh, and, and now God has revealed that. So you can just see what the rulers... Now, here's the, what I find is kind of interesting, is that all of the Jewish hierarchy at that time just played into that whole issue. Did they know this was coming? Did they know they were being deceived? I don't think so. Uh, in fact, when Jesus looked at him, he said, and I'll quote this one for you. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's what he said to the Jewish hierarchy at that time. Did they know they had been deceived like that? No, I don't think they did. Now, these were the Jerusalem insiders. 
This is the power people of the day. These are the ones who are going to do what they can to hang on to their prestige and their power, not unlike the Washington insiders that we have today. Now, you listen to these guys and have an Adam Schiff or somebody like that sit there and tell you a lie, and we know it, and it's been documented. Why is there no conviction? There is none. Do they ever feel remorse over that? You would. I would. Why don't they? It's consistent with their father, folks. You know, situational ethics is an interesting thing to me because, we, you know, that's clearly denounced in Scripture. But the end can justify the means. So if, if I can lie and somebody gets elected, that's okay because I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. But for a Christian, that's anathema. That's, that's, that's wrong. It's never right to do wrong even though that good comes from it. You never compromise who you are is, is what we're saying and uh, so did they know that? Did David know he was being deceived when the devil put it in his heart to number the troops in Chronicles? No, I don't think so. David had a whole heart for God, by the way. Um, and yet it was wrong what he did. And Nathan, his, his uh, commander in chief, said, don't do that. Sin. Why are you bringing this sin upon us? He did it anyhow, and thousands died. Now, see, the, the trouble with that is you're left with the question, how did Satan do that? How did he put that into the heart of David? A man who really had written that there was no hope for victory in a horse. So this guy's confidence was in God, and suddenly it's transferred over to, how many troops do I have? There's a deception. That's not seemingly to us a major sin, but at one time that w it was for David. My Lord will fight for me. Uh... But you're left with the question, how do you do that? Do you sit down with a pitchfork and a red suit and face safe and talk to him in a natural realm? No, these were David's thoughts, or at least he thought they were. And therein lies the deception. The thought came first person singular. I will number the troops. That's deception. Did Judas know he was being deceived? When David put it in his heart to betray Christ? I don't think so. When he realized what he'd done, he went out and hung himself. And you look at um, the early church and uh, Ananias and Sapphira, you know, bring half of their money. <laughs> Everybody else was sharing everything in common. And they brought only half and gave it to the Lord. And um, Peter comes along and says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and struck him dead? And you would probably say with me, dear God, don't do that in our church next Sunday. I mean, who would survive? Would you be disappointed if these folks gave only half of everything they owned to the church? If you sinned that bad, we'd have a revival. <laughs> well, that wasn't the sin. They gave half, allowing people to think it was all. But that's not a capital offense, folks, is it? I mean, wow, that's kind of heavy-handed. Why did he do it? Well, I'll tell you why. Because God knows that if the devil can get into your home, your family, your marriage, your church, undetected and get you to believe a lie, he can control your life. And there's the struggle. And so that message had to be sent very clearly to the early church. And why it's essential for us to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. If it's not true, don't believe it. The anecdote for the father of lies is not research or reason. It's revelation. You've got to know the truth. And thy word is truth. That's our protection in this world today. Don't buy the lie. Some people say, well, Ananias and Sapphira weren't true believers. Oh, theologians don't buy that. F.F. F. Bruce wrote that uh, they were believers. Another theologian said that Ananias was a Jewish Christian and commented, Satan has filled his heart. By the word, why has Satan filled your heart? That's the same word to be filled with the Spirit. The point of it is, whatever you yield yourself to, to that you shall be filled. Satan has filled his heart. Ananias has lied to the Holy Spirit inasmuch as the Spirit is present in Peter. Hence, 
In the last resort, it is not simply two men who confront one another, but in them the Holy Spirit and Satan, whose instruments they are. Well, healing wounds and sending captives free. Uh, in latter days, we're going to pay attention to deceiving spirit. Let me, Arrhenius said, um, the devil, however, eh? as he is the apostate angel, can only go to this length as it did at the beginning, to deceive and lead astray the mind of men into disobeying the commandments of God and gradually to darken their hearts. And that, I want to suggest to you, is, is really happening all over the world. The devil's roaring around like a hungry lion seeking for someone to devour. Uh, I said, but he doesn't have any teeth, but he's gumming Christians to death. <laughs> <He's>, uh... <clears throat> Let me go back to my diagram here, if I can, for a second. And, and show you what happens. I mean, you know, fix your eyes on Jesus. He's our example. Gave us a, an example of following his steps. But you stray off too far in either direction. Things get rather predictable. It's kind of fascinating to me. Um, you go off over in that far right-hand corner, you got legalism. You also have Islam. You know, hard, fast, rixed rules, you know, that's totally bogus, of course. Uh, what this diagram tries to show you is that you have to accept the reality of the natural world and the spiritual world and the responsibility that humans are supposed to play in the process of it. Uh, you, whether you go left or right, you can, you can uh, expect God to do too much, I said, or you can do too much. And um, in finding that balance... <laughs> important part of Christianity, folks. I mean, you know, Calvinists and Arminius, they draw the line in different places. and and um, But various groups, you know, put more emphasis or less emphasis on different aspects of it. And I, I think you can see that there. It's, uh, I grew up in the evangelical world, you know, and basically it was a natural world view. All of the West is in this diagram is skewed to the bottom almost of the page. Uh, you go into certain animistic countries and third world countries, it's all skewed to the top of this page. And uh, some expect God to do it all. Some try to do it all by themselves. And uh, the liberal left, you can see, and there's where all your medical models are at, by the way. And uh, you can put most of your mainline old Protestant churches there that, you know, Lutherans and Episcopalians, and some of them have gone just totally off the table in liberalism. And... Uh, and then the Pentecostal and Charismatic groups, they put more emphasis on the spiritual realm. And uh, these are broad strokes, folks, so don't, don't let me uh, say I'm judging anybody here. But um, where Pentecostals may put a little more emphasis on, on the human element, by that I mean, you know, we have apostles and prophets, and, and um, you, you know, if you just come to this stadium, this anointed person will be here and solve all your problems for you. If you're looking for that, let me just tell you, that anointed person has already come. So if you're looking for a man to solve your problems, you're looking in the wrong direction. And uh, charismatics uh, have a tendency not to focus so much on the, the man, but on the gifted parts of Christianity. Now, I'm not saying what's right or wrong. None of these fit me anymore, to be honest with you. I just don't like man-made labels. I'm a child of God serving God in his kingdom. And uh, half the churches that have invited me over these last 30 years have been more uh, the Pentecostals and Charismatics, and the other half, the liberals don't invite me, you know. <laughs> it's, it's been interesting. The other part that's kind of fascinating to me is, is where we put our emphasis in terms of helping people. So look at the next diagram. Is, uh, you know, I grew up kind of in... Well, actually, I grew up in a liberal church. I started in that lower left corner down there. And uh, then when I came to Christ, you know, I went over to the right and became a evangelical. And uh, then I started moving towards Christ and having my eyes opened up to the reality of the spiritual world. Uh, not just the negative side, but the positive side of the Holy Spirit's presence in my own personal life. And, uh, but, so... I've taught both at seminary, counseling and discipleship. Uh, so the concept of deliverance, you can kind of see it's in, what they emphasize. Now, one good church could be doing all four, for instance, but I'm just saying 
that uh, inner healing has grown a lot of strength around the world. Here's my conviction. Uh, I personally believe if we understood it properly, we would be accomplishing all four. It's not either or to me at all. It's both and. The strange part about that is, I've, when I was putting this together, I mean really some time ago, and kind of for our own staff, because we're running into different types of churches around the world, and, um, and trying to really seek and find that balance, it was kind of an aha moment for me, because I have presented at all types of those types of conferences that have invited me to come. I said, why are they inviting me? You know? <laughs> and I said, what Mary is doing in her freedom thing is all four. There's just, I may be the only pastor teacher ever that's written books from a Christian worldview perspective on anger, anxiety disorders, depression, chemical addiction, sexual addiction. Because as an engineer, before I became Christ, I was a system engineer. I wanted to see how all the pieces fit together. And the moment you don't have a holistic answer, something's missing. And somewhere along the line, you have to help people assume their own responsibility. I can't set you free. I can't heal your wounds. Only God can do that. And so when I sit down with another individual, there's not two of us present. There's three of us present. And I try to get out of God's way. And uh, I have a ministry of reconciliation is really what I have. And I facilitate a process. But the core of that is, is so simple, it just escapes us. It's just repentance. That's what ties them all together, repentance and faith in God. And all of a sudden you read Mark chapter 1, repent and believe the gospel. Where is the repentance? It's missing all over the church. Well, I confess my sin. That's not repentance. So if all you're doing is confessing, you're confessing and sinning and confessing and sinning, and you're going to give up after a while. You sin, confess, repent, stand firm, resist. Know who you are in Christ. There's one definitive passage, and I'll close with this, that really, to me, just summarizes it. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but able to teach uh, and with patience. And... Uh, if perhaps God may grant repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, having escaped from the snare of the devil and having been held captive to do his will. It's not a power model. It's a kind, compassionate, able to teach model. God wants you free, folks. Did you know that? It's for freedom that Christ sets you free. When I wrote the book, I had one thing in mind. I didn't write it to save the world. I wrote it to save the church. I'm seeing people cave into this woke movement all over the place. I said, don't buy it. If your kid decides he wants to be a furry or something today, uh, don't believe him for the kid's sake. You know, believe Christ for the kid's sake. You know, you don't change your salvation because your kid has a problem. If your kid has a problem, that's when you need to hang on to your faith and be the savior of that family. It's... Uh, I'm just blowing my mind what's going on in our world today. And I think the devil is having an absolute field day. And so if there was ever a time, I wrote this book for one thing. Knowing these things are going to come to pass, what manner of man ought you to be? Hey, hopefully you enjoyed that message. If you want to learn more about Freedom in Christ, we have our Freedom Center ministry at southview.cc slash freedom center. Um, go there, make an appointment. Have a great week.